Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the best parts about being a parent, about being a father, is that I get to play with all my kids' toys. One of my favorite toys, I mean, one of Isaac's favorite toys would be these Hulk hands. Are these not awesome? He's got a whole like costume and mask and everything that goes with this. But the best part, the best part about these Hulk hands, Hulk smash! It, it, can you hear it? Hear it. It says all kinds of stuff. Makes noises. Hulk smash! My favorite line though is this. Don't make me angry! You won't like me when I'm angry! It's awesome. Now there are some people in life that we would expect to hulk out from time to time. Our angry uncle, right? Uh, maybe our, our parents after we've been a little bit irritable towards them if we're if we're children. But there's other people that uh, if they hulk out, it causes us to question why. In our text for today, I think what we see is we see Jesus go hulk smash. But why would he do that? I mean, this is this is Jesus we're talking about. Jesus, the one who has compassion for the hurting, mercy on the sinners, brings healing to those who are broken, even sheds a tear, sheds tears for, for those who are grieving. And yet here in this story, Jesus is angry. You heard the story already. Jesus and, and his disciples and Jews from all over the world, all over the Roman Empire, have come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And Jesus and his disciples, as, as good Jews, they are there as well. But when Jesus gets into the temple, he looks around and he sees what's going on. He sees the, the money changers and he sees those who are selling sacrifices, the, the cattle and the, the, the sheep and the doves. And, and he just flips. Literally, he's, he's flipping tables. He makes a, a whip out of, out of cords and he's driving the cattle out of the temple. But why? Why? Why, Jesus, why did, why did you flip at that point? I mean, was it daylight savings time change and you lost an hour of sleep the night before? What happened? The common, uh, I think, understanding of this passage is this. That the money changers and the businessmen who are selling the, the animals for sacrifices, they, they were corrupt. And, and because they were corrupt, Jesus was mad. They, they, they're taking advantage of the common folk, the common Jew who was there to sacrifice before the Lord. And with that being the case, I think our application would, would be pretty, pretty straightforward. Don't be a dirty, rotten scoundrel who rips off the common folk. Don't go Enron. Uh, on, on people, right? Or, or whatever business you want to uh, take it out on. And, and while that is all good and theologically true, like we should be honest in our business practices, there is a problem with that interpretation. And it's this. It's just not what the text says. Look at it with me here. 
John chapter 2. What John records is this. Verse 14, he says, In the temple, Jesus found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. That, that's, all, that's it. <laughs> no mention of corruption. No m- mention of greed or graft. And even in Jesus' words, when he does start scolding these, these individuals, in verse 16, it says, And Jesus told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. But he says nothing about corrupt business practices. You see, I think... I think what had happened there is, is a little bit more subtle and yet a whole lot more serious than even corrupt business practices. I believe the Jews of Jesus' day had lost focus of God's intended purpose for the temple. Here's what I mean. When the temple was built, it was built as the house of God. The very dwelling place of of God on earth. It was the place where people from all over the world, Jews and Gentiles, could come to have an encounter, a confrontation with God. Now, now, keeping in mind, God is holy, and people aren't holy. And so part of that whole deal, like when you come before a holy God, they brought a, a sacrifice. They sacrifice a, a, often a, a lamb, right? That's what the Passover was commemorating 1,500 years before Jesus' time, when God had delivered the people of Israel from slavery at the hands of Egypt. And the tenth, he had given the ten plagues. And that tenth plague was the, the plague of the firstborn. But if that Passover angel, excuse me, the angel of death came over and saw on the doors blood of the lamb, that angel of death would pass over that house and spare the firstborn in that place. So this, the whole thing about the temple, the whole deal there, is this was an opportunity for, for Israel to come before their God Almighty. And not only to come before him and to bring a sacrifice so that they're uh, uh, ritually clean, but also a place of prayer. Jesus refers to the temple as, as a house of prayer where people can take their petitions their pleas for mercy, their pleas for help before God Almighty. But something happened that changed what was happening in the temple. 46 years before this time where Jesus and his disciples are at the Passover feast, Herod the Great had started a building project. And it was an expansion of the temple on an enormous scale. And and what happened is, as this temple was being built up and the temple mound was being built up, I believe the Jews started losing focus on what the temple was all about. The, temp- the, the sacrifices for, for Passover, they used to be uh, uh, held or, or sold over across the valley on the Mount of Olives so that when people came from all over the world, they could buy their sacrifice and then take it into the temple. But now, because the temple courts are bigger, they decide to move the market right inside the temple. Why not? It's convenient. It's easy. But it loses the focus of the temple's purpose. 
to be a place to encounter God. Now, no longer in the temple do you hear the murmurs of, of prayers who are, uh, of those who are going before a holy God, but instead you hear the moos of, of cows. And, and no longer do you smell the incense that is rising up before the Lord, but you instead smell the, the flatulence of livestock. And that change changed the whole purpose of the temple. It changed from a place of relationship with the Father to religious rituals. And that, that understanding of the text can be a bit more challenging for us today. Dishonest business practices, that's something that we can easily hold at arm's length. As long as you aren't ripping people off, you're safe, you're good. But when we realize <laughs> that a subtle change in, in, in worship can change the entire experience. Now, now we have to start being a bit more introspective and asking if we're in danger of some of the same mistakes. Yesterday morning, there was a movie shown here uh, called uh, God Has Left the Building and a group of about 100 people were here to, to watch it. And and uh, is somewhat disturbing, but also somewhat uh, accurate, I would say, uh, what the condition of the church today is. Churches are dwindling in, in size. Worship attendance is going down. And so there was some time for discussion after the movie, and then after that I had one individual uh, come up to me with tears in his eyes and, and uh, obvious hurt and passion in his heart and he asked me the question he's like pastor why is the church dying and and I fumbled through some answer but I've thought about that more since then there's a lot of Reasons that we can uh, throw out there, we could list for the, the apparent death or dying of the church, um, the lower worship attendance, and these sorts of things. But you know, as I thought about it, I kind of think that a big one is maybe just a subtle shift. No different than, than moving uh, um, cattle from one side of the valley to the other to make worship a little easier. Has there been a shift in how church is perceived and how church operates? Has the church become not a place to, that facilitates a relationship with God, but more of a dispenser of religious goods? Oh, uh, we want to get our spiritual fix today. So we'll go to church for an hour. We'll leave and we'll feel better. Ah. All right, we'll just go back next week. Or, or our children need to be brought up in the ways of the Lord. We'll send them to Sunday school. We'll let the church professionals at midweek school. We'll let the pastors at confirmation do all the teaching. And, and we'll just kind of say, yeah, You've done it. Even though, even in Luther's small catechism, when he writes uh, the, what is essentially the curriculum for confirmation, it says, as the head of the household ought to be teaching his family. Subtle shifts. Subtle shifts like, what's going to make worship services more convenient 
shaving a few minutes off, making communion quicker. I know I'm poking, (laughs) but I think these are questions that we do have to ask. Are we making the same shift, making the same mistake that the Jews of Jesus' day day made when they were, were just looking to make the sacrificial system a little easier? Are we shifting from relationship to God to, to a religion? A meaningless religion, an empty religion of rituals. And this is where each of us as individuals have to step back and ask ourselves, are we family members at this family believers or are we spiritual consumers? Jesus, in his discussion with the Jews, obviously they call him out. Who do you think you are to do this? to tip over these tables, to, to drive cattle and sheep out of the temple. What, by what authority are you doing this? And Jesus' response is, is, is awesome. He actually makes a, a, pro, a prophecy here. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Destroy this temple. I used to misread that as saying... Uh, I will destroy this temple. That's not what Jesus said. The Greek is clear. He's, he's double-dog daring the Jews. You guys, you destroy this temple, and I'll build it up in three days. Now, of course, the, the Jews will never, never destroy their precious temple. It had taken 46 years to get to this point. And yet... <laughs> Part of what Jesus was saying is that they were already doing it by changing the temple's purpose from what God intended it to be. And of course, not only were they already doing it, but they ended up finishing the job. Not by destroying the the physical structure, the building of the temple, but as John tells us, by destroying Jesus himself, who had become the dwelling place of God on earth, who had, be, who had become the, the place where man and God can f- come in contact and confrontation and relationship with one another. They destroy the temple of Jesus by hanging him upon a cross, and in so doing... <laughs> Catch the irony here. In so doing, they also destroyed their precious temple building. Because now, by destroying the temple of Jesus, the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice, there is no longer a need for the temple building. God no longer lives in a building. There is no longer a need for sacrifices. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. And he was sacrificed for you so that you may have a relationship with God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus was sacrificed for you so that you may have access to the Holy Spirit who now dwells in your heart. And not only was Jesus, the temple, destroyed, but he was rebuilt three days later, just as he said, just as he promised. Believe in this. Believe in Jesus as the true temple. Believe in this. Believe that the the physical temple needs not be rebuilt. Believe that Jesus is the sacrifice. Believe that Jesus is the way to the Father. Believe that you have a relationship with God. Believe that, that you all are now a family of believers who live together. And 
and believe that the one who is able to take a destroyed temple and build it back up in three days is the same person who promises that he will build his church. And he has. And he does. And he will always. As we come and, and, and gather at the Lord's table as a family, we come to receive the presence of God in our very hands, in our very mouths, and to receive once again forgiveness and life and salvation that only He provides. Believe in this Jesus. Amen.